see so. Oh, it's fabulous! A strike to get you up off your feet! Hello, welcome to Seagull Social, Season 4, Episode 19. And this is a bit of a double header this time, Louis, uh, because we have very polar opposite games to talk about in terms of Brentford and Burnley. Um, but before we get into any of the, the fun stuff about yesterday, because it's a very, very frustrating one. Um, how are you, mate? It's good to have you back on. Yeah, no, it's good to be back. Yeah, no, it's, it's been all right. Um, obviously, very, very, like you say, quite opposite. Uh, outcomes to the games, the last two ones that we've played, but you know, it's uh, just sort of typical of our season, I think, very up and down. Yeah, I agree. Um, and let's start. Let's start with yesterday, I think, because it's on obviously on the forefront of all of our minds. And it's just a typical game. Um, if you if you picture a Brighton three o'clock kickoff against Burnley, I think I put the tweet on beforehand. It's it's so typical, um, but. I don't. I don't know where it where it lies. How we managed to get beaten by teams in exactly the same way nearly every single time. But it seems, Louis, if you come to the Amex and you time waste for a considerable amount of time, you'll more than likely get a result. <laughs> yeah, we try not to sound too salty, but yeah, I do agree. It's. Um, I think it. Teams are starting to figure out the fact that they know that we will be the ones applying all the pressure like that we'll be the ones really trying to pile on and 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 take a, a grip of the game and if they can sit off and absorb that pressure for enough time and hit as quickly on the yeah. counter i think that's when they realize that will be the you know the perfect opportunity to to strike us so again the time wasting is perfect for that because they know that we're going to come at them hard so if they can kill as much of the game as they can works perfectly in their favor what do you what do you put it down to in the you know is it a mentality thing do you think is it is it because we've seen it so many times you know as brighton fans not just this season but you know years years gone it's always been the same thing is it you know we have a team that's going to sit back we have these 20 shots that you know half them you, you credit to james trafford he's done a good job um that's about as much credit as he's going to get for the rest of it. It was time wasting again, but um, yeah, the the credit to goes to James Trafford for the amount of saves he made. I think it was ten; it's the most in the Premier League this season. Um, but I don't know. Is it a mentality thing in that you just once a few don't go our way, we almost let our heads drop a little bit, and we almost get a bit desperate and we're scavenging for a goal. I mean, I, I think you do have a point there, like. I, I did tweet about it saying it was one of those games where a bang average keeper turns into prime Gianluigi Buffon against us. We've seen it so many times throughout the years. I remember we had a game against Palace where Guaita yeah, turned into yeah. the best keeper I think I've ever seen against us. Uh, and we just couldn't break the shackles. And actually, to be fair, I think that game against Burnley felt very much Potter-esque in terms of the performance. Like We just peppered them. We peppered them all game. And then they get one or two opportunities and they, they break through us. And I just think, yeah, as good as that was a performance from Trafford, and again, we don't want to give him too much credit, but yeah, like you said, I think we did get a little bit desperate um, and just the opportunities, as soon as they stop falling for us, it becomes like a sense of frustration, like you say, amongst the players. Um, and it, it's quite difficult to know where to turn, I suppose, when you're on the field and you just feel like nothing's going your way because they're so difficult to break down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's let's start with the first half, shall we? Because it was a very dodgy first half. Um, you know, performance-wise, it wasn't anywhere near what we normally do. I mean, we had a couple of moments. I think Lalana gave the ball away ten times, which is, I think, on the last podcast that we did, I said that he's probably one of our best players when he's playing. For him to then go and put in that first half was very, very typical. But overall, I mean, it was Dahoud. I think it was Lalana kept giving the ball away. And then we've had, what, I think three or four opportunities where they we've pressed them well. And it's clear that they don't like being pressed. We've won the ball back and whatever. But we've just almost, that final ball was, it was not even existent, was it? No, I think that is something that as a team we have lacked quite significantly. Um, it's just that final bit of quality. Like we've shown how good we are in the build up and working that ball forwards and getting into good positions. But then it's just that cutting edge 
And I think you see that in the stat sheet, the fact that we had, what, I think it was 24 shots during the mm. game, maybe more. That is yeah. complete testament to the fact that, you know, we're getting the ball into good positions, but it's just that final cutting edge that we're just lacking. And I guess, again, it probably comes down to that sense of frustration that we get from facing a team like Burnley who are happy to sit behind the ball and just suck the life out of the, like the energy out of the team. Like, it's just, yeah, it's exhausting. It's, it yeah. is exhausting to watch. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, they were there for one thing, weren't they? Um, and I think, you know, for me, when I see the amount of chances we've missed, I always get that PTSD, as you say, that them real Potter games we had. Um, I think we've played Belaber quite deep, and we again, we don't we sort of use him as a sweeper. Um, I think we went to a back three in the second half as well. So we're using a little bit obscure, you know, formations for what we usually would under Deserby. But then again, the amount of um, the amount of changes we've made this season is is unbelievable. I think we've had sixty seven changes to the starting eleven, which is by far the most by far the most in the Premier League. I think the second is Forest, I think, and they've got 40-something. Again, it's an, it's an insane stat, right? And you put it down to injuries, whatever. But are you thinking that's that's helping? Because, for example, the likes of Verbruggen coming back in, and then you've got Dahoud coming straight back in. Dunk, Dunk comes straight back in. I mean, you know, we've then got to almost reset, and, you know, maybe it's not that surprising that the final ball wasn't there. Yeah, no, I think it is... Um it very much does come down to giving people enough of a time to sort of get a flow in the starting eleven. I think just constantly switch. I think switching the goalkeepers yeah. is a little bit of a strange one. I get that De Zerbi has his, you know, he has a soft spot for steel and, you know, what he's done for us in the previous season or two. But, you know, Verbruggen, I, I personally believe Verbruggen is the better of the two keepers and that he should be getting a decent run of, of games in the starting eleven. And Beleba, I like this new role that he's kind of adapting to and, and getting that sweeper, but he is the one player in midfield that gives us just that little bit more of a, a presence, like a physical presence, which I think we lack with the likes of having just Lalana or Dahoud in there or even Billy Gilmore. Like Gilmore's sort of moulded more into that yeah. role, but we we still need that that real physical presence, that bully like we used to have in Caicedo or Bissouma that we just don't have if Belaber's not there. And I think giving Belaber a chance to sort of settle into that role would be great. But if he's going to undertake this new role that Deserby's kind of giving him where he's set as more of a sweeper, I think we still need to then look in, you know, in the January window to pick up someone who is really going to be that enforcer in midfield, that person who's going to take control. Because uh, at the moment, I, I don't see it from anyone other than Belaber. No, I agree. And I look at when obviously Igor came on second half, it's a complete polar opposite. Obviously, we had Milner playing um, left back. <laughs> I I personally just don't see it. And I like I like the idea of Milner. I, I praise the signing as in terms of what he's going to do for us off the pitch. But at 38 years old, when we've got the injuries we do, I know. But putting him in left back, it, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work right back, doesn't work left back. Unfortunately, I just don't think it works with Milner full stop. Maybe unless he's coming on the, off the bench, maybe in the last 10 minutes to see out a game, but he goes into midfield. Maybe I could live with it a little bit more. But I just think starting at left back, it, it, I haven't I haven't seen it work for us yet, uh, apart from in pre-season. And I look at Igor, it comes on the pitch and it, it's like a complete difference in quality, complete difference in quality. I mean, I I like Igor a lot, in case you hadn't noticed. And I, and I think that that's what needs to happen. He needs to just be playing, even if it is at left back. Um, because as you say, you, you want Belaber to be starting in that midfield as much as he can. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm not against him learning other things and that that's part of Deserby's way. But I just I just think that there's quite an obvious answer. I don't know about you, in, in, in having Igor there from the get-go because he's clearly a, a quality player for us now. Yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely agree with you. Um, I just think Igor, to me, is a very, very defensive-minded left-back um, if he is going to play in that role, which, again, isn't necessarily a bad thing. But if you think about the contrast to Stupinian, who has been obviously our staple for the last year oh, yeah. or so, that is much more it? of an attacking fullback. Yeah. yeah, Yeah, exactly. I guess it's just working with what we have at the moment. And I agree that I don't think Milner is suitable to start. But I guess it's that makeshift while we're sort of trying to figure out the injury crisis uh, and who's going to fill in that spot. And I, I think, yeah, Igor would be handy to have in that left-back 
position and it allows Van Hecker and Dunk to sort of form more of a solid partnership as the two central defenders. So I, I, I don't see why we shouldn't and actually I quite like what Igor's been doing recently with his progression like he seems a lot more confident taking the ball forwards I remember yeah, the game does. against Athens there was one one play where he's just strode through into midfield played a beautiful pass through to Ferguson who fluffed the one-on-one -on -one. but that is much more of a the characteristics that we want to see out of our, out of our defence yeah, and just before we get on to proper second half stuff, I know we mentioned the substitution, but I mean the the goal. <laughs> this is this. I think honestly, I think I lost my head with this one, and I don't normally when we concede. Normally, I sort of just sit there and accept, and you know, you you have that like you know that feeling of just sitting there with your arms crossed and staring into the distance while you listen to the two hundred away fans celebrate because you didn't actually hear it. Um, <laughs> sorry, but I think when they can when we conceded in the way we did and we've we've they've not had a kick in the game realistically they haven't had a kick in the game and it was actually as he was running through I've said to my dad next to me they've not done anything so if we if they can if we concede here you know that this is just. The, the the same old thing and I'm gonna just predict that we're gonna just either lose or draw this game, um and and it happened and it's a it's a shot on the edge of the box, it's taken a huge deflection which to be fair at the time I didn't realise it did, and it's just looped over Bruggen I think he got a little bit of a hand to it, and it's probably it's probably poor all round to be honest you look at how he got through our defence midfield and then Verbruggen maybe you could argue should have maybe got away with it I'm sorry got rid of it but I don't know. It's uh, analyze that for me, uh, Louis. In terms of not just the goal itself, but I mean the the typical nature of being a Brighton fan with that goal. You know, I I must. I was thinking about this earlier. Yeah, that I'm pretty sure out of all the teams in the Premier League, we can see the most deflected shots because you think about all of our players. They're wanting to we put their do. body on the line, which is great. However, we must concede the most deflected goals out of anybody. I think about pretty much. Every single game that we end up conceding, even it's either from you know. you know not not properly dealing with a corner, yeah, even in the championship, but no, not properly dealing with a corner or having a deflected shot, and it just seems to be the same thing over and over again. And again, I don't mind people you know getting the, throwing their bodies in the way. It's what Dunk's done for years, but it's just so typical and unlucky. And like you say, it's kind of the first sniff they really had in the game. It was a bit of a poor show from us to like lose the ball. And it was almost like a game of FIFA, you know, where you, you feel like you're completely dominating the fixture. You're having all the shots, the keep other keepers having a blinder and then they have one shot, which takes a fat deflection and then they go one nil up. It's yeah. You couldn't really make it up to be honest. It's just very, very typical of, of what no. we do. <laughs> But there's, but why? <laughs> but why? This is this is what was winding me up. This is what really really wound me up is when it went in the back of the net. I'm just like, how does this happen every single time? It's not as you say. We don't just concede. I, I wouldn't mind if they dominated us and we conceded two or three goals. I could live with it a little bit more then. But because we have to get time wasting mm. and the and the cheating and the diving and the rolling around, and you don't get enough time at the end of the game. I think that end of that second half, we had two minutes added on. Which is an absolute joke. And then you've wasted so much time. You've lost probably about 10 minutes of that first half. And you've conceded to a deflection when you've been on top. I just... It's, it's football, I know. But it just seems to happen to us so often. So often. It is, I, could, I said this mm. before. I think it was after the... Um, I think it was after the Fulham game. And I said, you could write a book on how to beat Brighton. And, that's, and all you've got to do is turn up, <laughs> put, your, put your man behind the ball and time waste. And then try and ca catch them on a counter because you're probably going to run through their midfield because we haven't really, as you say, replaced Caicedo properly. And then, and then just hope for the best. Just have a, have a shot, and it'll probably go in. And, and that's that's what's really annoying, isn't it? Hmm. Definitely. Like it's it's that same sort of process every single game. Um, and like you said, I think we are becoming almost very predictable to break down. And I can see that Deserby's working on like new shapes, new formations, new positions for players, just to see if we can try something different when it comes to, to getting the ball forwards and, and trying to create chances, which, again, absolutely happy to do. I do not mind that whatsoever. But it's at the moment, we're still seeing the same problems reoccur of just 
you know, conceding yeah, you know, exactly. a silly deflected goal or just them getting one chance and capitalising on it while we just don't take any of the chances that we should do at the other end. Um, but yeah, it's just, it is very, very frustrating and we don't want to sound too salty, but it is, yeah, it's it's very much a familiar story. It's true though, mate. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then on to the second half, obviously, make the changes. As I've already mentioned one of them in Eagle a bit later on. But if I just talk about um, Dahoud and Lalana for a minute, obviously, bring on Mitoma, we bring on Gilmore. I saw Gilmore getting quite a bit of stick. And don't get me wrong, I've, I've changed my tune in terms of he gives the ball away too much. But I was quite surprised in that how he was almost being dug out as a reason for you know, almost throwing the game for us. I, I found that quite baffling. And not to mention, obviously, Matoma came on, probably did a lot more than um, Dahoud or Lalana did in that first half anyway. Um, even still, by his standards, you would want a little bit more maybe. Um, but Louis, Lalana, Dahoud, more so da- Dahoud than Lalana, to be honest. Where where do you see him in this team? And it, this isn't to me digging him out. This isn't me even slandering him at all. I just want to know where you think his best place is and, and where you think he's going to work. Because... Maybe he hit a little bit of four before he got injured. Sorry, before he got suspended. But I just, I'm just trying to work out where he fits in when we do sign some players in Jan. No, I, I do know what you mean. He's um, he's quite he's quite a flexible player in that you know he can sort of fill in a, a multitude of positions through the middle. But I think that might also be his weakness at the same time that he doesn't really have a role that he's like excellent at. Like because I, I feel to me he's more mm. like that sort of ten role that we should be seeing someone like Pascal Gross in, but is he better than Pascal Gross? No. Yeah, agree. Right, and you can have him have him as a deeper lion playmaker, but is he better than Belaba? Probably not. Like he's definitely not as physical. He's maybe a better ball player at the moment, but does he give us that physical presence that we need? Also, no. So because he hasn't yeah. really carved himself out a role. I don't know whether he's really going to have a place to to really like shoehorn himself into the team. Um, so it's yeah. it's quite difficult to see where he goes from the moment. And I do I think that one game against Burnley was probably his worst performance. However, I don't think that's really reflective of how he's been this season. Um, but again, it's kind mm-hmm. of just trying to figure out where he fits in if he wants to be, you know, a, a true starter. I think he really needs to try and define himself more of a role because at the moment I don't really see it. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm not sold yet, um, and that's not me, as I say, digging him out. I just, as I say, as, as you say, it's just trying to see where he fits. Um, you know, when when we have a fully fit side, and in January we bring in, I'd like to hope some reinforcements. My goodness, I mean, that's worth a mention mm. actually. The Deserby thing. Um, so obviously he's in talks a new contract, as we as we know. Uh, he's confirmed it, but he looks like he's trying to finalise a target. What that target is probably doesn't really take too much working out. Um, January is around the corner, and we know Deserby's history. Um, you know he likes to be backed by his board. He likes to, he wants the best. He wants to win and he wants to improve, and he deserves to. And do you think in, in the if he doesn't get that this January, it will it will. Maybe, maybe force him to not want to sign, or be maybe be a bit more reluctant to sign that deal, um, just because of the nature of how he is in in trying to succeed. Absolutely. I mean, like he obviously he has a very clear vision for what he wants his team to be and where he wants it to go, which is great, and I absolutely back him for that. And I just feel like maybe. You know, if the board can give him a little bit more of a backing when it comes to the signings, you know, he's made it very clear he'd like to sign someone like Domenico Berardi. He's made that very clear. You know, he's been he's been someone he's worked with throughout the years, and he knows exactly what he's capable of. Um, and just you know, if if the board can give him what he wants, because I feel like if we give him the reins, he can take this team to ridiculous heights, really. So. Once he gets that back in, if we can get in, for me, I think it needs to be a full back on both sides. Like as much as I love Lamptey, I don't know whether his fitness is going to be able to hold up long term. Uh, and also, yeah. you know, we can't just constantly use a stupid young because he's just going to keep getting injured. We need that midfield enforcer. We need someone that is going to really, you know, actually give us a presence in midfield because I feel like that's where we're getting overrun the most this Would you year. Take Calvin Phillips. Um, really? We need someone on the. 
Ah, uh, would I take Alvin Phillips? I don't really know because I think well, obviously we know there's a player there. He's shown it in times when he's played for England and when he was at Leeds as well. However, is he what we need in terms of that real physical bully? I don't really think so. Um, it, it just, I, but again, it's quite no, quite hard to know who to put in that space. Um, I think we also need to get someone on the right because I, I feel for me, because Mitoma is such a presence on the field and how good he is, teams tend to double up on him, which would leave a lot more open space for everyone else across the front line. But on that right-hand side at the moment, until we really get in CISO back, but I don't really think in CISO his best position is on the right, we, you know, if we can have that threat coming from both wings, we can be such a force mm. because then teams do not know who to mark. You know, if you double yeah. up on Matoma, you have well, to we then give the Mitoma other person last year, much, much more freedom. Yeah, we were. And I, I think March, he is, you know, obviously he's a very threatening player and he's very good defensively as well, which is quite handy when, you know, you're trying to transition. But from an attacking sense, probably not the best and, and, and could be better. And obviously that's something he'll be working on. But yeah. what's the answer? Hmm. I think, well, I think a dinger is, this is a good chance to mention a dinger. Um, Cause he was, he was lively again. Um, I think a dinger is very raw, isn't he? Uh, very raw. You can tell he's, um, hmm. he almost, he almost plays football a bit like Kasenga Luar obviously a lot better than Luar Luar ever was for us. But I mean, <laughs> Luar Luar, yeah, it just just it just reminds me of him in that he's very um, he will sort of drive at a player and it will almost try maybe one too many step overs at times. But he's very raw and he's very direct, so he'll get the ball and he'll try and run. And I think that's a it's a good thing. Um, but I do think his sort of his output is a little bit maybe when he gets into them positions, he puts the ball across maybe one every five actually are a decent ball in. Um, and that's probably the one thing you would say that Adingra mm. needs to work on. But I think because he's only 21, um, I would say he could be the answer. But I, I think it, I think he needs help at the minute. Um, obviously, he comes up with a goal. He's he's become Mister uh, Mister Reliable for us in the sense of he never really played for us before, and now he's pretty much played every game this season. And I'm quite surprised he hasn't actually managed to pick up any injuries so far. And touch wood, by the way, because I wouldn't put it past him now. Um, but yeah, Dingram, mm. Louis, obviously got, he got the goal. Um, is he? What, what do you see as his potential, and, and where? And when do you think sort of he could maybe do with that rest out of the team, um, which is maybe where someone in January could come in and help? I mean, I see his position. I think from what we saw of him at USG, he was probably most you know uh, most effective on the left hand side. But obviously, that's where Mitoma plays. I like the way he's adapted to playing on the right, but again, right now we just haven't quite seen the cutting edge. And again, as you say, he's 21 years old, still very raw, but De Zerbi clearly sees something in him that, you know, he's got the potential to go very, very far. The same way he sees that potential in Bonanotte, you know, and, and having that, that cutting edge and that end product will be the thing that takes us to the next level. And asking that of a 21-year-old at this stage of their career and this stage of our you know, exactly pro progression. Yeah. Obviously, it's a hell of a lot. Yeah, I agree. And um, so, just just because you mentioned Bonanotte, I'm going to bring him up in the same conversation because um, he's he's improved a lot. I think in a, in a very short space of time, he got a lot of um, stick, didn't he? I think he got quite dug out, almost scapegoated at times, which was very harsh. I always thought because um, he is so young. I think he came into mm. our first team when he was 17, um, and obviously. Oh, I just muted myself. Then. I think um, who is it? I think it was Tevez, wasn't it? Said that he he was like almost like the next Messi or something like that. And then Deserbi's obviously trusted him. Then he got called up to Argentina, and probably in the recent times you've seen him start to flourish. Um, do you think that he's better suited to being in the ten role? Because I do personally. I think he's definitely got that potential to be possibly a driver for us, picking the ball up and taking on players uh, with the ball at his feet. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I, I agree. I think he's better in the middle. Um, like, I think the the problem that he's had is that he's used to picking up the ball with a couple of yards of space around him. But because he doesn't get afforded that in the Premier League, he instantly will be the one that's ha has got a defender on his back. But you've seen when he has the time to pick up the ball and turn and dribble, he looks incredibly threatening. And, you know, I... I 
I've never really been his biggest fan, but you know, I would I would love more than anything to be proved wrong that I don't think he's because currently I don't believe he's fully ready to be starting or to be playing for us. I think he needed a loan yeah. to give him a chance to really develop and pick, build up some confidence. But I think in recent games he's actually has picked it up and you know looking a lot more confident in that ten role. And obviously, Deserby trusts him. The fact that he's played him so much and he said that. I want you to then become this player for us. But because we're so deep yeah. in terms of players that can play the 10, you know, we've got the likes of João Pedro. I still think Pascal Gross should be playing the number 10 because that is his best position. We've still got Adam Lalana. We've still got Dahoud that can play there. You know, having Bonanote as well, even in CISO, can play through the middle. That's a hell of a lot of options. And Fati as well. Like, there's so many players that can play in that position. There's a lot of competition. And obviously, it's good to have the depth, but. I guess being 18 is going to play in his favour, the fact that he's got plenty of time to adapt into that role. But yeah, I think he's probably better as a 10 than out wide because I don't think he's quite as quick as you'd need someone on, on the on the wing to no, be. Not. Uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah he so shouldn't I, be on the wing. Probably. I think it's just an um, adaptation period. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, yeah, no, I, I, I would agree with you. I think, yeah, definitely through the middle. Um, as you say, when he turns, he's, he's a lot stronger, um, I think. But... Again, it's, it's just time. As we always keep saying on these podcasts, it's just time. you just got to wait. Unfortunately, we do have such a young team. Um, and then and that's the perspective of it. We've got a young team that's injury riddled all the way down to the core, to the point where our experienced players are all out. And, you know, when they come back, it's they've got to then settle back. So it's difficult. It's very, very difficult. I think, honestly, it's one of the, the toughest jobs this season is keeping Brighton to play well. Um, and there's Herbie's doing a a decent job of it. And I think what's really frustrating and more than anything, as I've mentioned before, is the time wasting. And this is the last point. So the the game, obviously, it, it fizzles out. It's one of them. It's a frustrating one. You give yourself the hope. You become delusional. That's the fun of being a football fan, isn't it? You think everything's going to go in for you and it doesn't. Um, I thought Hinchwood was unlucky a couple of times. Um, it was good when he came on, actually. Uh, just, just a little shout out on Jack Hinchwood because he's done really well. Um, but yeah, we'll, uh, that last sort of 10 minutes or so. Um, I think that there's eight minutes added on. And for two of them, I think the goalkeeper went down with cramp. And then the referee still blew bang on eight minutes. Not to mention the fact that we probably could have had 20 minutes added on because of the amount of times we lost. Now, this has been a problem this season, not just for us, but for the, for the Premier League. They, they wanted to solve it, didn't they? And this is the point I wanted to get to. They wanted to solve the problem of time wasting and cheating in the game. So they wanted to try and almost make it, you know, they add on more time like they did in the World Cup. And they started doing it. But it feels like we've just taken a complete back pedal on the back of yesterday as well. And I don't know I don't know if this is where the where the ever lies down to. But what do you put it down to, Louis? And and how frustrated do you do you, do you make of it? I mean, to be honest, I I just think it's more of an issue where teams know that they're on the back foot, right? And they're trying to absorb as much pressure as they can. So they're trying to kill off the game as quickly as possible just by taking as much time as they can just to, you know, just to get as close to the final whistle as they can without, you know, with damage limitations, essentially. And I think teams know that we, especially us, you know, we're, we're so ball dominant as well. And we look to try and really take a, uh, an iron grip of the game. If they can take as much time away from us as they can, then obviously that plays much more into their hands in terms of getting a, a more beneficial result. But like you say, I think the the time wasting thing across the league is is becoming worse. It's just more of a a case, like you say, just trying to kill the game. But people aren't really getting punished for it. You know, if there was actually, you know, I know you see goalkeepers get. Occasionally, they get yellow cards for for taking longer than they should do for kicking. You no, know, taking <laughs> James a, a Trafford goal kick. didn't get booked yesterday. By the way, that's insane. I know that was insane. That is absolutely insane. But um, yeah, I think there just needs to be some more consistency generally across the league. I mean, generally, uh, uh, it's, it's difficult to take digs at people in their professions, but. I just think the general standard of refereeing has been pretty poor. Like, not even just on the time waste in front. I think yeah, the, the decisions against us have been absolutely atrocious at times. And I'm not just saying this because mm. it's it's Brighton. But, you know, if you look at some of the errors that have been made against us, it just looks a bit suspicious almost. It's a very, very weird. Very weird. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you put it when you put it us and Wolves. I think if we if we if we had a long conversation with a Wolves fan here, I think we'd probably have about a two hour podcast on just decisions against our two teams alone because they're probably the second best team to us in terms of the amount of awful awful decisions I've seen go against Wolves this season. I give I I, I feel for them yeah. as well uh, because it's exactly the same as us. Um, it's tough, but yeah, we'll we won't get onto a referee rant because I think in, in the last five podcasts, I think we've done it in the last three, um, at least three out of the five. Sure. <laughs> um, but what I will say, yeah, is that they need to, they have to clamp down on time wasting. They have to, and and the cheating, diving. The, the, you know, I think the guy that got subbed off. I don't I don't know after Burnley players to be fair. It's awful ball knowledge, and the guy that got subbed off just went down. His, his, his number comes up on the board, and he goes down. And starts and he's on the floor. I was thinking that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Is that you've you've got requested to come off the pitch, and then you go down. And I was like, that's ri- that is the most ridiculous time wasting I've ever seen. And he still goes off of that card. Yeah. And that's that's just the thing. The bookings are so inconsistent. And and how they, I, I just kept saying the, the James Trafford was taking the mick out of that referee yesterday. Absolutely taking the mick out of him. And he's benefiting from it. And I think that's what's the most frustrating thing. It's just. Oh, anyway, anyway, I won't get too much into it. Um, but on the back of the Brentford game, um, I'm not going to go too much into Brentford because I understand it's out of most of our minds now because of that game. But um, it's worth mentioning it a little bit. And um, obviously, we've we've won a game um, at home, which I think the Zerbi was quite happy about. And it's on the back of against the team again that's very prone to time wasting. Uh, in the past, has caused us some problems. They're never an easy team to beat Brentford. But... Um, <laughs> What, what's the contrast between that game and, and Burnley, Louis? What did you put it down to? Did you just put it down to fixture congestion, Marseille in mind on Thursday? I don't think you can really put it down to fixture congestion because a lot of the teams around us in the league are in the exact same situation and they seem to be coping just fine. I think, for me, like you look at the contrast between the way we played at Brentford and the way we played against Burnley... You know, they they both set up very differently. Brentford don't really look to conserve behind the ball. And you could kind of see that when we were pushing forward, we looked more threatening and we took way more of the chances that, you know, we needed. But they were also creating the same amount of chances as we were in that same sort of sense. It wasn't like a completely one-sided fixture. And I get that the one clear-cut chance they got was that penalty where, you know, we committed a a very, very silly foul. Um, But... You know, we, we ended up turning the game around. We were, I say, more clinical in front of goal. You know, we took more of the chances uh, and we got the win in the end. But against Burnley, who we know are going to be the team that sits behind the ball and, and tries to, you know, absorb all that pressure, the same way like Everton did against us last year, you know, we got completely diced, basically. Sean Dyche, masterclass. Um, but Burnley did much <laughs> the same thing. They is. Yeah, they did. They did much of the same thing against us, and you know, there's there's only so much you can do against a team that is just gonna try and you know not not take the game away from you. Just try and completely drain you of any energy, and then hit you on the counter. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you compare the contrast yeah. the game but against the... Brentford, it's it... yeah. Sorry, I, we've got a huge delay on our side here. By the way, can you just give some credit in the comments here? Because mm. I think we've got a good four or five <laughs> seconds between myself and Louis at the time of recording this. It is agony. It is agony because I, I say something and I've yeah. got to sit here as if I'm actually listening to you, but I'm not. Um, but credit to Ben, he'll sort it all out in the edit, and it'll sound like we're probably talking over each other. But no, I was going to just say about um, Jack Hinchwood. Obviously, he got his first goal in the Premier League. Uh, he didn't get the correct Superb. amount of appreciation from Seagull Social that he should have done. Um, although he did on social media in general, but um, he, what a moment for him. Um, and then obviously coming into this game, uh, he comes off the bench, Louis, and he, he looks like a different man. He, he comes off the bench, looks like he should be there. And, you know, he's gone from being this, this little kid that's come through our academy to being tested out, you know, are we sure about him? And he comes off the bench as if he's, you know, he's the man now. He, he should be in this starting eleven, and and almost, you know, one of our important players now, would you say? Yeah, I think he's really laid down a marker for himself and for the team to say, you know, I'm here. And it's going to be one of those situations where everyone on social media is like, Brighton have done it again, they've unearthed another wonder kid or whatever. But, you know, the first couple of games yeah. he comes in as a local holding boy midfielder boy. and he's, yeah, as well as a local boy, yeah. But, you know, he's come in for the first time 
and he's playing in a position that's unfamiliar to him. His first game was against Villa, where he's playing as a makeshift left back, even though we know he's a holding midfielder. And, you know, we get absolutely yeah. overrun. That is a pretty, you know, it's, it's a trial by fire, right? And it comes to the Premier League. It doesn't get much tougher than that to lose, what is it, 5-6-1. You know, it's it's not not nice at yeah. all. It's a, it, it, I, I'm sure for a lot of players it could break them mentally because, it's, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really get much worse than that for a debut. Not that it was on him, but in terms no. of results, it does. And it's the fact that he then took that in his stride and he comes back and, you know, he's still playing in this unfamiliar position and he makes it his own. And I think against Brentford, he was absolutely fantastic. You know, when Mbomo came off and um, Johan Wisser was running at him down the right-hand side, he kept him locked up. And it was it was amazing to watch, really, that confidence that he's built just from having that run of games in, in the team, that he looks like a completely different player already. And if he continues to get that, you know, the faith from De Zerbi, which I think... Deserby putting his faith in these players is what's really transforming them. We saw it with Solly March first of all, like, and you know I think that's probably been the biggest differential that we've seen since Deserby took over. Yeah. But if if um, if Jack Inchelwood continues this run of form, who knows how far he could go? Because he's shown clearly he's got the skill set, yeah, and he's now he's growing in confidence, and he's versatile. He can play in a multitude of roles. Who knows how far he could go? But I think, like you say, he's he's almost becoming one of our more important players. You know, filling in for an, you know, during an injury crisis, and he's made several roles his own already. Yeah, I agree. He's he, he's really impressed me genuinely, and I, I think when I first saw him coming into the team, I thought, you know, good player, um, but you know, is he is he just a bit too young for it? Um, obviously, he gets completely overrun at Villa, as you say, and it's it's a game against a team which is genuinely one of the best in the league this season, as we saw last two results. Um, and and it was it's always going to be a really really tough game. I think it was with Gilmore, um, and you know between them there's not too much muscle in it, you know. And you've got Douglas Louise, Ollie Watkins, etc. Some really really powerful players in that Villa team. So it was it was a bit of a mismatch in that sense, and it was really really harsh for him. And it was probably the biggest slap he could have received of a debut. Um, but I think, as you say, to take that hit around the head to say, look, welcome to the Prem, mate. This is not as easy as you think it's going to be. You're not playing FIFA now. And then come back into the side, as you say, at left back. It's It's been really, really impressive. And I think the last sort of game or so where he has moved into midfield, I mean, yesterday he could have scored two, um, you know, but for a good save uh, from from Trafford again. <laughs> I can't, I'm getting sick of saying that guy's name, um, but it's a good save. And, you know, he could have won the game for us. And um, he's clearly shown that he's got that attacking ability as well. Um, he can, he can, as you say, lock up some very decent players, did it at Stanford Bridge, Sterling as well, did a good job on him. Um, and it's really, really reassuring to have someone coming through the academy that's a, that's a Brighton boy. You know, he's a Brighton fan and from Worthing. I think that's brilliant. And um, yeah, long may it continue because I really, really hope he can, you know, he's in the right hands with De Zerbi, isn't he? Let's face it. So if he's, if he's going to be with anyone, I think to have a, you know, to be surrounded by your Lewis Dunks, your Adam Lalanas, Danny Welbeck, Roberto De Zerbi, it's a very, very good mix for a young player. Um, so, I mean, Pascal Gross was compared to him, wasn't he, as sort of the father of him? And uh, I think it was De Zerbi almost mentioned Gross in the same breath as Hinchwood in that, you know, intelligence wise. And that's that is probably one of the biggest accolades you can receive as a Brighton player, as a Brighton Academy graduate. Um, so no, full credit to him. Um, but yeah, I think that's just about it really in terms of game stuff because it's it's a frustrating way to, to end a podcast because I wanted to talk about Hinchwood. I wanted to talk about our young players, uh, Dingra as well. And I, I don't know, Louis, if you're to put perspective on it, do you say... You know, you, you're saying these names out loud and, you know, they're, they're players that weren't even playing for us last season. And, you know, is it that perspective of it's always going to be a tough one? And, you know, we've got to focus on Europe. We've got to make sure we get through to the latter rounds there, as well as focusing on the Premier League. It's, it's nowhere near as easy as last year. No, not at all. Um, you know, it's it's very much a different landscape to what we were facing last year where we had basically one sole focus which was the, the league whereas now you know it's a, a much more congested season in terms of the fixture list um, and we've obviously been hit by a bit of an injury crisis so for these young players to step up the way they have is a huge credit to all of them and I think especially the likes of Hinshelwood who you know he's, he's come through our academy 
and it's also a testament to our academy and the way we set up, like you say, with um, De Zerbi saying that he, he feels like the son of Pascal Gross. You know, that's that's a huge credit, like you say, a player of such quality and such technical ability at 18 years old to be have that comparison is yeah, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. And for these, if these young players continue to take these steps forward, playing in a European scenario, this team has got absolutely unlimited potential. Absolutely unlimited potential. And if they continue to take these strides forward and, and continue through, you know, I think the sky really is the limit for this side. And if we can keep it all together, instead of, you know, selling off the best pieces as soon as we get a, a big offer, you know, unless there's a, a fee that's yeah, completely that's unignorable, for example, that's, that's the next stage. I want to be that club where we're not just producing talents and selling them off. I want to be that club that people go, I want to go to Brighton. I want to join the project. I want to be part yeah. of this team. Instead of being, Brighton have got some good players. If we give them enough money, we can acquire that player. You know, we, I want us to yeah. be the end goal. I want us to be the place that people yeah, go and say, I want to play for them. But also on that, it's about not getting overhyped. I mean, I think Ferguson's probably prone to it. And this isn't me digging out Ferguson by any means. Hear me out. It's he's come into the team, probably one of the best finishers that the club's seen come through their academy since ever, right? And and, and he's an absolutely world class talent. But he's almost got this outside reputation like he's now Harry Kane. And, you know, to to put him on that pedestal at eighteen, I don't know if it's almost you know, maybe taking it out of him a little bit. You know, he's almost got that pressure. He's got the weight now to be the number nine for Brighton. I just don't think he's there yet, anywhere near there yet. He's there to to improve. I think he needs a couple more years. Um, and I think that that's probably the, the next thing of, you know, players shouldn't just be expected to come in, score a bunch of goals in their first year, or whether it's goals, whether it's good performances, and then move on in the summer. Because football doesn't last a year. Football lasts... Mm indefinitely and I think that that's what people forget is that you know they're they're coming in now yes yes they might score in their debut yes they might score another five goals but they need to they need to have that year to you know Ferguson's hold up play probably isn't the best he needs to you know his dropping deep doesn't always is not that effective when he's not in the box probably you'd want him to do a bit more and I think that's the three key points of being a good centre forward where if he was at a big club like Manchester United or like a not a Chelsea, uh, like a City. Um, I think that you know that's when you're going to probably get digged out for that sort of thing. Whereas at Brighton, you can almost get away with it a little bit. You can get the time to to progress, and that's that's the beauty of it, I think. But um, yeah, that's the next stage, isn't it? But um, anyway, I Absolutely, think yeah. I think that's just about everything covered. Um, any, any other points we missed, Louis? Are we, I mean, considering we've had a double act here today. Um, we've had no one else with us. I've yeah, asked no, I think, four I think people to come on. I didn't mention. Right. Yeah, we have. I didn't ask Jack if Jack watches this. Uh, I didn't ask you, mate, because it's your birthday, and I didn't want to. Didn't want to say. Uh, <laughs> do you want to come on a podcast on your birthday? Because I felt like that'd be a little bit unreasonable. So happy birthday, Jack! If you are watching, happy birthday to Massa's dad as well, who's uh, unfortunately missed the podcast due to that. I don't know why Ben's missed it, but um, we'll just we'll just call him a plastic. I think is what we'll go with that one. Um, but yeah, we'll yeah, uh, see Ben's you plastic. probably. But who's the next one? Marseille. Ben's a plastic. Put that in the comments below. Um, and yeah, Louis, thank you very much for joining me, mate. You've done a very, very good job at last, last yeah, thank minute. Thank you for having me. Cheers, man. Um, as always. Of course, mate. Absolutely no problem. Um, and we'll see you just before Marseille. We'll probably do a preview. Try and get the boys back together for that one if I can get Ben out of bed for it. Um, but no, I'm just joking. But yeah, we'll see you just before then. Uh, thank you all for listening. Like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And uh, yeah, we'll see you very, very soon. And goodbye. See you around. Thank you.